The main thing would be the noise. Okay, we're live, man. Oh, we were. Look at that. Okay, we're back. Oh, there we go. There we go. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so, what's up, everybody? Welcome to the first episode of Deeply Rooted. Um, I've been wanting to do a show for a long time. Um, just kind of, you know, my background in music allowed me to, you know, meet a lot of interesting and different people. You know, coast to coast has taken me a lot of places um, and frankly changed my life. Um, some of these dudes, you know, you may not know their name, but you will definitely know their work. You will definitely, you, I don't know, they'll be familiar to you, most of them. This first particular guest, um, I've probably learned more from him than any one man. Um, outside of, you know, my father and my uncles and, you know, um, he teaches me all the time. I know he says I teaches him, I teach him as well, but like he teaches me all the time. I learned a lot from this dude. He's a good friend of mine. Um, so his, his name is Will, the weirdo Wilson. Um, if you know the bomb squad or if you know any of that, um, this is me, Keith and Will. Um, were 5150 lock and load. Um, that's when I first professionally met him, um, the beginning of the, well, I guess when we not met, but I guess when we started working together, um, was on the Bomb Squad album. Um, again, this dude has been, I mean, his resume is impeccable. And I chose him as the first guest because I, I really think he exemplifies what this show is. Um, he's honestly the first person I ever seen look at the money and decide to choose integrity, decide to choose family, decide to pick up everything at the peak of his career, I guess you would say. I mean, making it to LA um, in the situation that he was as an engineer coming from Atlanta, which he can tell you about these things. They're not really relevant to the conversation, but they are. Um, he walked away. And, you know, it's this thing about success. You know, and everybody seems to think, you know, money, uh, material things equal success. And I tend to think it's more about the effect you have on the world. If you plant a seed, and it grows and it sprouts and it has branches and it has roots, you're successful. And there's not a person that I know with a bigger tree than this guy right here. So um, without further ado, my friend, my homie, my knucklehead partner, Will the Weirdo Wilson. What's up, man? Oh, and by the way, he's in Mexico by the beach. You know, us here in Kansas, we're freezing our ass off. He's in Mexico by the beach. Um, so, <laughs> what's up, man? How you doing, man? I'm doing good, Tony. I'm doing good. So Glad I, that you're uh, your show cracking. No doubt, man. We've been talking about it a long time. Um, I know you know. Um, so, I'm glad that we finally are doing it. Um, I want to just jump into it, man. Um, Uh-oh. Let's get it. Who is Will the Weirdo? Did you catch me? No, I didn't. Sorry. Oh. You know, All right. I'm complex else bouncing around. Sometimes it comes through. Sometimes it's a little So loud. who who is Will the Weirdo? Um, Again, he's in Mexico, so we might have internet issues. Um, just bear with us. Uh, look, it's, it's not even him, it's us. So what happened? It dropped off? Oh, you can't get in? You ain't even watching? <laughs> Hold on. Are we back? 
We dropped Did out. Did you lose me? Yeah, we lost you. I, I don't know if it was your end or my end. But, um, again, I was asking just simply, who, who is Will the Weirdo? Actually, who is Will Wilson? Um, I'm a military brat who traveled the world when I was young. Got to see a lot of different cultures, a lot of different things, and learned a lot of lessons that I took with me and um, I learned that life is short and you need to do what you're passionate about. Music was what I was passionate about, so that's what I did. Kind of pretty simple. I mean, there's a lot of complexity, but at mm. the core of it's just pursuing the thing that makes me happy, you know, and pursuing the passion. I, you know, you learn traveling. People are people and life is short, so. Do the thing that makes you happy. One thing I think you, it. one thing I think you definitely left out is teacher. Um, you know, not well, just not just me myself. You know, I mean, from your kids. I mean, you teach every day. And here's a here's a good here's a good will story I like to tell. One time I was looking for I had a problem in the studio, and. I was like, obviously, I could call Will and I can ask him, but I'd like to try to figure out things on my own. So I Googled it. And the first thing that came up was an answer from Will in a whole nother forum that answered my problem. So he answered my question in Google without me having to call him. That's Will. He, he, you can look and just Google that name. You'll learn all you need to know about audio on Gear Sluts. <laughs> Yeah, wow. man. So, okay. Well, how do you define success, man? Success for me is split up in two parts. Okay. One is personal side and one is social, okay. external. On the internal, the personal side to me, success. And, and, and I say two sides because I really mean these two come together in different ways for me. Okay. But on the personal side, internal side, it's waking up each day in pursuit of my passion and the thing that I'm driven to do, uh, which of course in my life has been music. Oh, no. So every day that I get to wake up and I'm in a good place and I can be in a creative space and I can pursue that which I'm passionate about is an internal success to me. No doubt. Externally is when what I'm doing internally reaches beyond myself, That's whether cool. it's teaching somebody, whether it's recording a song that, you know, reaches millions of people, yeah. that external success um, really is the, the, the going beyond the individual mm -hmm. and who you touch with whatever that it is that you're doing. So for That's me, great. success is the two different parts coming together. No doubt. That's dope. That's dope, man. That's a great answer. Um, what drives you? How about this? How about this? Can you, real quick, before you answer that question, can you give me um, a quick couple minutes on your resume? Just your professional music resume? I know you don't like to do that, but I'm, try but I'm trying to make a point um, with this show. And you know it's easy for us to sit here and talk and people just think oh tone's talking to some guy you know what i'm saying and i know you're not some guy and i don't you know i have what what you call bob marley memory so i will forget <laughs> you know what i'm saying i'm sure i'll forget so just a quick yeah. one man some of the heavy hitters just give me some of them man <clears throat> well I would say I started with Draggy D okay. um, when I came back to the U.S. And music-wise, we were the first hip-hop group releasing music in the state of Kansas. Okay. And what and year was from, that? From there, I went. What year was that? Or did that you say it already? That was 80, 89, 90, 91. Okay. And, and then um, I was a part of Nuthouse which was the precursor to what everybody knows as Tech Nine, but it was a group of 10 creative individuals from Kansas City, Kansas, Kansas City, Missouri, 
um, if I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with Nuthouse. Um, from Nuthouse, I went on to do Best Kept Secrets and, and Who Ride. Worked a lot with the uh, Arsenal Click, AKA the Heavyweights. Rest in peace, man. Um, okay. Yeah, Jay Rock. Jay. And um, yes, our boy Jay. Yes, and um, I did, you know, worked all over Kansas and Kansas City, working with a lot of artists. And then uh, we did Bomb Squad. I mean, I'm, I know I'm leaving some projects out if I don't have a list in front of me. Yeah, of course. And then, of course, Tech Nine, we were there building the beginnings of Strange Music, where the behind the scenes people people like, like to forget. And uh, I mixed a lot on Angelic. Um I'm attempting to think what we, then we did Absolute Power. And then yeah. we're on Vintage Tech. Of course, this is the time when you and I were working together. No doubt. And then from there, I was back in Kansas City. We did the second Bomb Squad album. Uh, we did stuff like stuff with Cut Calhoun and Giselle. I mean, you know, a lot of music. I mean, yeah, so. we did a lot down there for sure. Now, and then, now that took yeah, you into. That took that took up to like 2005 when we were in New York with uh, Ray. And, uh, and 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 the people Ray which, is for those Ray Quant, yeah, from the Wu Tang Ray. And actually, you know what, man? Um, because it's so recent, you know. Rest in peace, Daba Chief, man. Um, Daba Chief walked us indoors, like that dude walked us into DJ Premier's studio. Like we just walked in, like that was mm. it. <laughs> that was it. Like like, what's up, y'all? How y'all doing? Like, all right. Yeah, so that, you know, rest in peace, Chief, man. Um, yeah. So, much love. Much love. Um, so, anyway, and I mean, I guess, you know, coming off of that, rest in peace, Keith, too. But, okay, so coming off of, what did, what did we do? We came out of that, then you went into All In, I think, in that second X Dash yeah. album. Well, yeah. We, yeah, it was the X Dash. It was the second X Dash album. And then. The All In, which was an attempt to uh, duplicate what they were doing in New York City, where the air, all the circles overlap, people all work together. Yeah. And then from from there, I moved to Atlanta, mm -hmm. and I got in with Dukes of Deville. Um, they were on Capital EMI at the time. Talented, talented boys, yeah. um, and they were. Then from there was I was in with Jazzy Faye which basically I was in the studio with any and everybody in Atlanta. I mean, from, I mean, Rico Wade would walk in our door one day, George Clinton the next day. <laughs> I, I mean, you know, it was, it was, it was crazy. Once again, it was, you know, coming from Kansas city, you know, it was just a blessing. And I, I worked hard every day, appreciating the opportunities, you know? And so I worked a lot there. Then after that, I was in LA and uh from la i you know worked did a lot of work was working at interscope and universal and atlantic and uh up north hollywood at bill's place and i mean yeah. boom boom room and you know all over and and another, then i you know, decided to go a different direction this was the thing oh, another favorite will story is will's the guy that'll come into a world-class studio and start unhooking shit and plug in his own shit while people are looking at him like what are you doing do you know where you're at and will will tell you well your studio is about to sound better than it ever has before in your life you know and so will is like really that guy like like when it comes to knowing a particular subject i don't personally know anyone that knows more about one so and not that he knows a lot of subject but i'm saying like about audio engineering in general like I don't know one person that knows as much about anything. You know what I'm saying? So, um, through all of those years, Will, like, what what drove you? Like, what kept you going when you know for 15 years there's no accolades? For 15 years, these people might not even know you exist, 
and walk past you every day listening to your music? Like, what drives you, man? What drives me is pretty simple, but that story goes back to when I was 10 years old. And okay. my father took me to um, Athens, and then I went to Egypt. Okay. And one day I was outside Cairo, and we were at the Pyramids of Giza, and I was standing on the pyramids. And all around you, when I'm standing there, is nothing but sand, and Cairo's in the background. And I realized at that point that I, I didn't mean anything. And what I mean by that is the pyramids have been there for thousands of years before me. And I knew they were going to be there for thousands of years after me. And so therefore, I was nothing but a piece of sand, which was all that's around me. No, no. And the thing is, that realization is what drives me. It's basically, as a piece of sand, I'm kind of insignificant into the grand scheme of things. Yeah. Except if you get enough momentum behind a piece of sand, it leaves a mark. And that's what drove me at 10 years old. It what drove me at 20. It's what drives me to this day. That's and dope. that's what drives me. It's that's leaving dope. a mark, whether no matter what it is, because in the grand scheme of things, I don't really mean much more than a piece of sand. That's ill. That's an ill concept, man. Um, I, I definitely, I can understand the power of that. You know, even though I haven't seen them with my eyes, I, I definitely can relate to that. That is dope. Um, so how has a failure or an apparent failure set you up for later success? And do you have a favorite failure? Um. I don't have a favorite failure. I believe every failure is a lesson if we're okay. open to learn the lesson. Okay. So failures aren't what something I view coming from a, a sports failure. background. Failures a favorite failure. were something to just teach you. Yeah. My failure that I, that set me up for success was actually the all in CD. Okay. So it's a classic example of when one door closes and a window opens, you know, there's that famous uh, saying, basically, I put my heart and my soul into the all in project. And the way that I approached it was I was attempting to bring all the different areas of Kansas City and the whole region together on one project. Yep. But do it in a way where everybody could profit off of that project. Well, when if we finally got it finished, most of the people that had committed to, 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 to supporting it didn't. So on the surface, it would have been something that would have been deemed a failure. Well, shortly after that, I went to Atlanta and I didn't have a job when I got there. The job I moved there for fell through, but I took a job at Guitar Center. And I was the worst salesman in the history of guitar. Best engineer, worst salesman. <laughs> well, the all in CD was my business card and I put it in and everybody's heads turned. Yeah. And what I failed in Kansas City doing when I got there, that opened up every door in Atlanta and I was only at Guitar Center for less than a month. And within under a month, I was working at uh, Patchwork, working on Dukes of DeVille stuff with Capital e for Capital EMI, had the president of Capital on the phone. Yeah. But, but putting 100% into that all-in project, giving it every ounce of my energy, my passion, my money, my devotion, set me up where not that long later, I have the president of Capital on the phone critiquing my mix at the biggest studio in Atlanta yeah. without doing that project, without giving a hundred percent and failing at that. I'm you not there, there right? less than a year later. Yep. Great answer. Um, Cause True I remember, story. I remember, um, I, I remember talking to you through the time. I remember, you know, when you were first getting them first jobs, you know, um, yeah. I pulled up to Atlanta I came right off the highway, and where did I meet you at? 
<laughs> studio. Like that's what this guy does, you know. Um, and it was really like like for you, or like for me being your friend, it was like it was nice to see you get that validation. Like like and not that you needed it, you yeah. know. I mean, we've been in rooms with Premier, bro. Like you know what I'm saying. And what what was Premier doing? Asking you questions. You know what I'm saying? Like, so it's, it was really, it's really nice to see you in Atlanta. You know, now the way the shit ended up, you know, is for whatever. You know, that's that that was for whatever reason. You're happy. So you can't say that it was, you know what I'm saying? Like, it is what it is. Yeah. But, um, yeah, so I, yeah, I was with you on that journey. So, um, okay, so if you could have one gigantic billboard anywhere with anything on it, what would it say and why? One gigantic billboard, I would probably say, to each their own. Okay. And the reason why is, it's a very simple concept, is that we are all different. Every person is different. For sure. And our differences are our strengths. And so many times, they make our differences out to be negatives, when in reality, it's what makes us as a race, as human beings, it makes us special. And to each their own is something that, because somebody's a little different, because they they have, they, they pray to somebody different, or they are married to somebody different, and they, they where they went to school, or how they believe, and all of these differences are our strengths. And they're not things to pull us apart, they're things to bring us together. Yeah. Because as you know, Tony, the things that you were, that you, your strengths, what made you special was not what made me special, but when we came together, we Killed could achieve them. wonderful things. We could have the president, or excuse me, the, the head A&R of Jive Records in Lawrence, Kansas, sitting in our studio, telling us to come to New York City, not because of anything other than our differences coming together to yeah. mesh like a puzzle. Yeah, and that's so what I was going to say. Especially in this climate. That's in what I was going to say. I learned that they, from you, right? You and I pre pretty much can't be two different people, right? Like, like you know, in terms of our upbringings and, and the way yeah. things were, you know what I'm saying? Right. And like you said, but, but when we come together, see that, like, I learned so much from you that it was like I, I actually learned that lesson that you never know where it's going to come from and when you have this when you have this judgmental yeah. or this negative energy you know what i'm saying you never you would never have this right here if i continued to think like that or if you continued to think like that if we didn't just open up it took us a while you know what i'm saying but it wasn't that was actually due to outside forces that you know what i'm saying we didn't really know but anyway let me get to the next question because that's only five and we'll be here all damn night um <clears throat> What is one of the best or most worthwhile investments you've ever made? Could be an investment in time, money, energy. Well, they say time is money, but I'm an energy guy. The most worthwhile investment I've ever made in my life was homeschooling my kids. Dope. Yeah. I and to to see how they responded, to see how they grew, to see them develop into the um, to watch one of them go to college at 16, to watch the other one take his time and go a different path. But it's in homeschooling them, not only was I able to educate them, I was able to learn who they were as people. I was help, able to help guide them and mentor them in a very, very close, but very relaxed, organic way, um, rather than sending them to professional strangers for six, eight hours a day. Yeah. I chose a different path, and that was one of the most rewarding things that I could have ever done. All right. Hey, hold on one second, Will, because that was very powerful, but I'm not, I want to make sure that they're catching this because... It paused on us. Um, so I just want to make sure. Because I, I, I'm able to continue to hear you. You know what I'm saying? But I just want to um, see 
how bad it actually is because if they're not catching this then i'll just pause the live stream and we can just i'll keep recording and we can um okay. i'll just release it later because because that's like that's the type of shit that we're doing this for they say not bad so we're just gonna keep rolling um okay. so basically if you didn't catch that um Will just said the best investment he ever made was homeschooling his children. And you know what, Will? I mean, this is this is about you, but because I know you, um, it's not just you. It's you and Drea. Um, you guys do uh, everything together. You make all the, yeah. you know what I'm saying? It's, it's like I never, you guys are really a team. So I don't want to leave her out like we're not thinking about her. Because to me, to say yeah. Will is to say Will and Drea. Um, oh, okay. so Andrea is his wife, um, yeah. and they, and his answer was beautiful because they homeschooled their kids. Um, they had their kids reading Howard Zinn, you know what I'm saying? And his daughter went to college at 16 and moved out on her own, you know? Um, so that was his answer. If you didn't catch that, um, well, well Tony, I, I, I'm going to interject real quick. Part of the lesson was this one day. Uh, Libby came home <clears throat> from school mm -hmm. and she was struggling reading cello. She was taking cello at the time. Uh -huh. She was struggling reading her uh, her bass clef. And normally you normally you you don't want to push them too hard. Okay. What I did is I printed off a bunch of sheet music and we studied. It was a Friday. She came home on Friday and she was upset. We studied Friday night. We went over stuff Saturday. We went over stuff Sunday. Monday, when she went back to school, her music teacher was like, wow, you've got this down. Yeah. Well, she came back home and was excited and she told us. And then she said, well, what happens when it gets hard? And I pulled out all the sheet music that I was teaching her from. And it was Tchaikovsky, Beethoven, yeah. um, Mozart, I pulled, she did not know that this was some of the more complicated music. We just sat down and did it. I didn't tell her it was hard, so she yeah. didn't think it was hard. So once I, she actually knew what I was teaching her, she just kind of smiled and was like, oh, I guess I'm okay. And I was like, yes. Doing homeschooling because I knew her personality and because I worked with her on so many things, I knew that I could teach her that way. But that's, that's the thing, and it's not for everybody. But it was it was it was for us, and yeah, yeah. Dre is my uh, rock of Gibraltar. She's no she's my uh, she's she she's my I'm her Spock. She's my Kirk. That's what we always <laughs> laugh. <laughs> okay, what is an unusual habit or an absurd thing that you love? Unusual habit. <laughs> Oh man! Is, uh, hey, I, if you don't have one, I have one. <laughs> well, well, what? What's your? What is? You know me so well. What's All right, my so, look, so look. If I set, if I set down a goddamn blow pop right now, right, and the way you eat them blow pops is is that is different. I've never seen that. I would say that's an unusual habit. <laughs> I, okay i would say for me probably one of my more unusual habits is if you get me on a subject i love i will talk your ear off and yeah. everybody that knows me all my friends from everybody from tech to you to jazzy everybody ray everybody knows if you're on a subject that i love I will talk your ear off. No doubt. No doubt. I, <laughs> I'll give you that. You but, I, but see, for me, <laughs> I, you know, I learned to deal with it. You're the only person I'll talk to on the phone for more than two minutes. And we might talk on the phone for three hours. Um, in the last five years, what new belief, behavior, or habit has most improved your life? I would say transitions okay transitions in writing um 
learning how to write better mm -hmm. helped me connect a lot of my thoughts in a more transitional way and that carried over to music yeah and it, it but it helped me in all kinds of ways as far as communicative wise yeah. so learning how to transition because i have um i have a computer in my head i have a thousand thoughts a second yeah. and i would have difficulty transitioning from one thought to another when in conveying thoughts and ideas and concepts to people yeah. well it made me much easier to work with and and much better to work with and be around is moving from one one thought process tra process transitioning into another yeah but it but it helped in every area of my life it was just yeah. something i was never very good at and i wasn't taught when i was growing up yeah but in the last five years that would be it for me dope. um what advice would you give to a smart driven kid about to enter the real world and what advice should they ignore? The advice they should ignore is what they can't do. Because the reality of it is they can do whatever they want. Whatever they're going to put their time, energy, love, passion, creativity into. If they're driven, they can achieve anything. Most people want to tell you what you can't do. No doubt. So I would tell them to ignore that. To, to stay focused on what the, it is that they really want to do and what they're passionate about. No doubt. Um, um, I'm sorry, what was the first part of the question? Um, what advice would what you would give I, them? Yeah, to somebody. My, okay, these kind of tie over. But okay. what I would tell them is to, I, I go back to Einstein. Einstein has a phrase where he said, if you give me an hour to solve a problem, I'll spend 55 minutes thinking what the actual question is of what of the problem, and then it'll only be five minutes to solve the answer. No so what I would tell them is to figure out what it is they truly are driven and passionate to do. Because if you can find that the rest of your life, you will pursue that with a, a level of intensity and 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 a completeness in that that most people can't comprehend yeah. if you if you don't really know the answer to that question you will waste a lot of years of your life pretending lying to yourself lying to others not intentionally but just you will it's the old fake it till you make it isn't really a very good phrase yeah. But it's taught so many times and people people get sidetracked unnecessarily and they waste years of their life that they could have been put into what they were really after and what they were really wanting to do. Because if you can find that one thing that you are truly driven to do, you can you can affect millions of people's lives. You can you can change things on a scale most people really don't understand you can i agree and that you know that's that kind of that made me think about like the point of this show you know um coming for where i come from like i don't have friends that quote einstein i mean i do because i have you and we talk about this shit all the time but like like most people don't so it's like I, this shit needs to be hurt so that's you know i mean I, I love that answer bro that was a dope answer um in in music in engineering what are bad recommendations that you hear in your area of expertise i think most things would qualify under good yeah everybody's after good and unfortunately, good is the enemy of great. And if people were just after good, we wouldn't have the Sistine Chapel. We wouldn't have Purple Rain. We mm. probably don't have a uh, thriller. We we don't have some of this beautiful art. And I, I, I related to music, but good is the enemy of great. And so many people settle for good and they're not willing to go the extra to, to go after greatness. And it's my number one pet yeah. peeve and 
and and and I believe it's it. Have fails. you read that? Haven't read it. Yeah, read that. Read that. Uh, Jim Collins, good to great. I think that was. I think it. I mean, that's exactly. You know, <laughs> that's what that yeah. made me think of. There, yeah. It, it drives me crazy. I, yeah. I, I. It wastes so many people's time, and I think it sets people up, unfortunately, for a lack of success. And you know what? It kind of goes back to your billboard quote. Um, to each his own because if for me you know in the music industry uh, you know when there's new artists or new people around I notice a lot you know they're chasing trends or they're they're trying to follow what's hot on the radio or just make me a club record and that's what he yeah. means when he says good is the enemy of great because how can you be great when you're tracing somebody else's picture you have to paint your own picture you know what I'm saying? And that's the mistake I see a lot of times is like, just do you. I mean, you know, that dude had the club going up on the Tuesday was the worst fucking artist ever. But he did him. Right. And and that it worked. So I, I definitely, you know, I think those two things go together. Um, Tony, that Tony, I'm going to interject. That's that was some of the best advice I got was from Dallas Austin and that's what Dallas said. Dallas was like, do you, because when things get tough, when times get hard, when you've got long hours and you're drained, if you're doing you, you'll just keep doing you. When you're so busy trying to do somebody else, you lose track of that when things get tough. I'm just thinking about being in New York and like, you know, sleeping on floors and big cockroaches and running out of gas and you know being in a neighborhood where Raekwon says you know me and me and Will were in Staten Island Port Richmond. at in Port Richmond at at Ray's house which wasn't Ooh. his house it was I don't know what it was an office studio but he kept it in the hood yeah. for some reason I don't know okay. why but it wasn't just the hood it was probably the worst neighborhood I've ever been in to the point to where Ray went out of town Oh, he went out the country for a couple of days and left me and Will there to work. And he yeah. said, okay, here's the deal. After dark, Will can't go outside. <laughs> so, Tom, <laughs> you got to go outside. And, you know, so, like, I just think about those things, and I'm thinking about, like, dog, that's how bad you got to want it, right? Like, you got, like, yeah. if you're not going through that shit, you don't want it, bro. <laughs> like, um, <laughs> so... <laughs> In the last five years, what have you become better at saying no to? I already know, too, on this one. <laughs> I'm kind of the opposite. I've always been the guy that says no. I'm like Spock. Yeah. I've gotten better at saying yes to things. Uh-oh. That's I've said I've said no my whole career. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm the guy that people didn't want to bring ideas or certain things to because they know I was going to be way too real and honest. With them. <laughs> so the the thing I got, I've said no to no. Yeah. I say yes more. I, mean, no. I say yes. Well, I mean, because you've known me a long time. I'm saying no is something I'm way too good at. Yeah, I've I've learned to say no to no by saying yes. Well, I think more open to ideas. I think Drea would say differently I, because you know, there's a lot of bullshit that you used to do working on, you know what I'm saying? that she'd be like, why the hell do you keep putting up with that shit? You know what I mean? So I, I think, you know, because, and me too. It's actually, for me, like, I got a lot better and, at saying and, no to that. Yeah. And in, in, in that instance of what you're referring to is, basically, I say no to people who I want success more than they, for them, more than they want success for themselves. No doubt. And when they're not willing to put in the time and energy into themselves, I, I, I say no to that. I just move on. I don't, yeah. I don't have time. If, if they don't, if they won't invest in themselves, then, you know, yeah. And it takes a while to learn that we, I mean, think, I mean, I'm not going to say anything was wasted, but we spent a lot of time on yeah. projects that went nowhere 
You know what I'm saying? Because people didn't put in the same shit that me and you were going to do. Like, you will sit yeah. and mix an album for 27 hours in two days. Yeah. On, you know what I'm saying? Like, And then the dude comes out to promote it, and he gives one-tenth that effort. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. So, yeah. So when you feel overwhelmed or unfocused or, or have lost your focus temporarily, what do you do? I put so much time and energy daily into my craft that I step away to recharge, whether it's running down to the beach like I am today, um, whether it might be, I mean, just leaving the studio and letting that energy and that passion just build up, you know? I mean, we all have times where we're taken out of our creative space so we need the time so we can slide back into our creative space so that we can be the creative beings that we're meant to be. I mean, so that's a big one is for me is take time away when I can. I mean, there were times working in LA or New York or Atlanta that I couldn't do that. In those times, I, I would just, I won't say meditate, but I would find a quiet time for myself I mean, sometimes, honestly, it would be going to the bathroom in the middle of a session with a really bad artist who wants to drink a fifth of Jim Bean and do a bunch of ignorant, disrespectful stuff. I might have to gather myself, go to the bathroom and just remind myself where, where I'm at, why I'm there, and just gather into myself. And I mean, uh, not meditating, but, you know, just pull my energy in and, you know, relax and Take that deep breath, let it out, and then get back in there for another 12 hours of... <laughs> <laughs> no no names mentioned, but those are true. They're, well, I got stories, trust me. <laughs> but I mean, you know. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes. Um, so what's the secret, man, to life, success? You got a secret I, for me? You uh, need a secret. You know, you know I'm a big... <laughs> I'm a big manifester, setting your intentions, and I, but I'm also real big on self-analyzing. I mean, in sports, they would call it self-scouting. Yeah. Self-scouting is sometimes your, your biggest strength is to be able to, to self-scout yourself, to look at where you can improve, where, where, where the areas that you, your strengths are, but where you can maximize those strengths. And yeah. so really it's knowing knowing yourself being able to like be honest and truthful and self scout yourself and to be able to put those into intentions to because when you know who you are you know what you want then you can visualize and manifest what you really want that way you can set your path and then work at your passion and go after those big goals well you for me they were always big goals you know what's funny about this question and me being you being the first person that I asked this question and that I phrased it that way and that you answered it that way is you gave me the secret um, on a burnt DVD, just one of our sessions, we were talking and you were like, you need this, the secret, like the actual secret, the movie, the book, you know, um, and I, I definitely mark that as a pivotal moment in my life when I gain the knowledge of the law of attraction um, and that my mind and what I think about really matter you know what I'm saying like and 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 that kind of is the secret like I like that they they frame it that way because it is man um, so well, that's dope man I don't know how long we went but that was dope I liked all your answers this is this is what I want this show to be. I don't give a damn if anybody watches this show except for one person that it helps, right? Like, I'm not doing this. I'm not promoting this. I'm not doing that, man. We're going to put up the recording so they can have it for any time. But it's also, you know, some of you dudes who, like, I've, with my own eyes, when I've witnessed the amount of work that you do, like, like, and I witness, you know, 
your sound collection, your your you know, like like how you have been building this studio for twenty years and we still have the same conversations that we would have had fifteen years ago. It's just you're in a better you're you you know what I'm saying, you're farther. So it's like it's really dope to like see you grow and you know what I mean, to be a part of that and you know, I was a fan of yours before I was a colleague of yours, you know what I mean? And that is like, for you and Rock, that's always been an honor for me, man. Like, like when y'all asked me to be a therapy brother, I, I still to this day am like, like, you know, like, you motherfuckers want me? Like, why the fuck would you want me? You know, <laughs> like, you dudes are legends to me, man. So I so I, I thank you for taking your time, man, and I, answering honestly. I mean, I know you're on your vacation and it's Valentine's Day, so... Okay. Um, to tell Dre I definitely said thank you for allowing <laughs> some time for this, you know. Um, for you, you know, she's she's totally cool. No doubt. Well, that's what's up. And and it's mutual. So, thank you, man. This has been awesome. I enjoyed it. Um, is there any well, parting words? I do have some parting words. Okay. Real simple. All right. Every life is a book. And every year is a chapter. And the beautiful part is, is we're writing our book every year. So what I would tell everybody out there is just keep writing. I mean, you've gone, maybe you've gone 35 chapters in and you want to make a change in 36, you want it to be a whole different chapter going in a different direction. You can do it. Do we it. can all do it. It's like, absolutely. We, we all have that in front of us. It's like there's nothing but possibilities, you know. Yeah, figuring and I out agree. our passions, knowing where we're at. It's like keep writing your book, and until that book is closed, it's always being written. No doubt. That's and I that's believe. this is a perfect example. Deeply rooted, a web series. This is a perfect example. I'm writing another chapter. We didn't know what the hell we're doing. We just did it <laughs> because yeah. we. I'm sick of talking about it. And, and we can figure it out later. And that, I mean, that's that's something I would say to anybody. Like, if you want to change, yeah. change. Yeah. That's it. Have some discipline. <laughs> you know what I'm there saying? I love you, bro. Um, thank you, yeah, man. Love you too, Tony. All right, I'm gonna holler at you. Yes, sir. All right. Peace. Let that shit go. What we gotta do? Did you end the call? Yeah, I ended it. Yeah, I ended it. Yeah.